Welcome to our transformative journey into the profound world of Sufism, guided by the timeless wisdom of Jilani's The Secret of Secrets. In this video series, we invite you to embark on a voyage through the heart of Sufi spirituality, one chapter at a time. Our exploration begins with chapter five, where Jilani's teachings illuminate the path of repentance, spiritual awakening, and the quest for divine knowledge. It's a journey of the heart, a journey to rediscover our divine origin. Within these pages, we discover that repentance is not merely remorse, it's a profound transformation of the soul, a return to our spiritual source. As Jilani reminds us, all will return to its origin. But how do we find our way back? How do we hear the divine call? Join us as we delve into the essence of Sufi wisdom, where the fear of Allah becomes a transformative force guiding us on this sacred voyage. Together, we'll unravel the teachings of this chapter, learn from those who have repented, and explore the profound impact of receiving wisdom from a purified source. Certain levels and stages in man's spiritual evolution have been mentioned. Let it be known that each of these levels is obtained primarily through repentance. The way to repent can only be learned from someone who knows how to repent and who has himself repented. True and total repentance is the first step. When those who disbelieved harbored disdain in their hearts, the disdain of ignorance, Allah sent down His tranquility on His Messenger and on the believers and made them keep the word of the fear of Allah, repentance, and then they were entitled to and worthy of it. And Allah is full knower of all things. Surah Fath 26 The state of the fear of Allah has the same meaning as La ilaha illallah. There is no God, there is nothing but Allah. For the one who knows this has the fear of losing him, losing his beneficence, his love, his mercy. He fears and is ashamed to do wrong under his very eye and fears his punishment. If one is not oneself such a person, one must find someone who is and receive this fear of Allah from him. The source from which this word is received has to be purified and cleansed of everything other than Allah. And whoever receives it should have the ability to differentiate between the words of one with a purified heart and those pronounced by the tongue of the common man. The receiver should also be aware of the way in which the word is pronounced, for words that sound the same may mean totally different things. It is impossible that the word coming from a pure source be the same as the word coming from elsewhere. The heart is enlivened only when it receives the seed of unity from a living heart, because such a seed is a healthy living seed. Nothing grows from a seed that is dry and lifeless. The sacred word La ilaha illa la, mentioned in two places in the Holy Quran, is a proof. They indeed were arrogant when it was said to them, There is no God but Allah, and they said, Shall we give up our gods? Surah Safat 35 36. This is the state of the common man, for whom outer appearances, including his own outer existence, are gods. So know that there is no God but Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin and for the believing man and believing woman. For Allah knows what you do wherever you go, and how you live in the secrecy of your houses. Surah Muhammad 19 These words of Allah are the guide for those pure believers who fear Allah. Hadrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, asked our master the Prophet to teach him the easiest, the most valuable, the most immediate way to his salvation. Our master the Prophet waited for the angel Gabriel to bring the answer from the divine source. He came and taught our master to say, La ilaha, there is no God while turning his blessed face to the right, and to say Ili Allah but Allah alone, while turning his face to the left towards his blessed pure heart. He repeated this three times. Our master himself repeated it three times and then taught it to Hadrat Ali. May Allah be pleased with him, making him repeat it three times. Then he taught the divine confession of unity in the same manner to his companions. Hadrat Ali was the first to ask for it and was the first to be taught. Then one day, when they had just returned from a great battle, the Prophet said to his followers, We have returned from a small battle to wage the great war, indicating the struggle with one's own ego, one's lower self, which is the meaning of the confession of unity. Your greatest enemy, he said, is under your ribs. The divine love will not come alive in you until the enemy, the desires of your flesh, dies and leaves you. First you must be cleansed of that ego that commands your whole being to evil, then you will have a partial conscience, although continuing to sin. 
you will have a feeling of self-reproach, but this is not enough. You must pass beyond that stage to the level where the truth will be revealed to you, the truth of the right and the wrong. Then you will stop doing wrong and do that which is right. Thus your being will be cleansed. Opposing your flesh, you must fight against its animal desires, gluttony, excessive sleep, idle occupations, and against the characteristics of the wild beast in you, negativity, anger, fighting, aggressiveness. Then you must work to rid yourself of the evil habits of the ego, arrogance, pride, envy, vengeance, greed, and all the other afflictions and sicknesses of the body and of the heart. Only those who are able to do these things are truly repentant and are cleansed and pure. For Allah loves those who turn to Him constantly, in repentance, and He loves those who keep themselves pure and clean. Surah Baqarah 222 In one's repentance one must be heedful that one's regret is not abstract and general, so that it does not fall under the threat of Allah's declaration. No matter how much they repent, they are not truly penitent, and their repentance is not accepted. This refers to those who have merely pronounced the words of regret, but neither know the extent of their sin, nor have vowed not to sin again, nor have taken any action. That is ordinary repentance, the outer repentance, which does not penetrate to the cause of the sin. It is as if such people are trying to get rid of grass by cutting it off at the ground rather than digging out its roots. In doing this, they only help it to grow better. The one who repents knowing his fault and the cause of his fault and wishing to rid himself of this fault, digs out the roots of this pernicious plant. When it is dug out, it dries, and it does not come back again. The trowel used in digging the roots, the causes of one's sins, is the spiritual teaching one receives from a true teacher. One must clear the ground before one can plant one's orchard, and we set forth the parables to man that he may reflect. Surah Hashir, 21. He is the one who accepts repentance from his servants and forgives sins and he knows all that you do. Surah Shura 25 And whoever repents and believes and works righteous deeds, Allah changes his evil deeds into good ones, and Allah is ever forgiving, merciful. Surah Furqan 70 Know that the sign that repentance is accepted is that the sin never occurs in one again. There are two kinds of repentance, the repentance of the common man and the repentance of the pure believer. The common man hopes to pass from evil deeds to righteousness through remembering Allah and exercising serious effort, leaving the desires and comfort of his flesh and forcing difficulties upon his ego. He must pass from egotistical revolt against Allah's precepts to obedience. That is his repentance, which may bring him from hellfire into paradise. The pure believers, the true servants of Allah, are in altogether a different state. They are at the level of divine wisdom which is far higher than the best state of the ordinary man. In fact, for them there are no longer steps to climb. They have reached the proximity of Allah. They have left the pleasures and benefits of this world and are tasting the delightful flavor of the spiritual realm. The taste of the intimacy of Allah, the pleasure of seeing His essence with the eye of certitude. The perception of common men is the common world and their pleasure is in tasting the material benefits of material existence. Yet while the very existence of the material man and the material world is in error, so too are the best benefits and pleasures of it. As the great saying goes, your existence is such a sin that all other sins are small in comparison with it. The wise have often claimed that many good deeds done by good men who have not reached the level of Allah's intimacy are no better than the errors of those who have come close to Allah. Thus in order to teach us to ask forgiveness for the hidden errors that we think of as good deeds, our prophet, who was sinless, used to seek forgiveness one hundred times a day. Allah Most High asked him to ask forgiveness for your sins and for the believing men and believing women, Surah Muhammad 19. He set the pure prophet as an example of how to repent, by begging Allah to erase one's ego, one's personality, one's individuality, all of oneself to take away one's very existence. This is true repentance. Penitence means to renounce everything with the exception of Allah's essence and to wish to return to Him, to return to the home of His intimacy, to see the Divine Face. Our Master, the Beloved of Allah, describes such penitence, saying, There are some true servants of Allah whose bodies are here, but whose hearts are up under the throne of Allah. Their hearts are in the ninth heaven, 
under the throne of Allah because the divine vision of his essence is impossible in the world below. Here only the manifestation of his divine attributes can be viewed, reflected upon the pure mirrors of pure hearts. As Hadrat Umar, may God be pleased with him, said, My heart saw my Lord with the light of my Lord. The pure heart is a mirror where the beauty, grace, and perfection of Allah is reflected. Another name given to this state is revelation, beholding the divine attributes. To reach that state, to clean and shine that heart, one needs a teacher who is mature, who is in union with Allah, and who is esteemed by all past and present. That teacher has to have reached a stage close to Allah, and to have been sent back to this lower realm by Allah, to perfect those who are worthy, but lacking. In their coming down for this task, such saintly men of Allah must travel the way of the Prophet, and follow his example. Yet their function is distinct from the function of the Prophet. While Prophets are sent for the salvation of common people, as well as pure believers, these teachers are not sent to teach everybody, but only a select number. While prophets are given total independence in carrying out their duties, these saintly teachers are not independent, but must follow the way and example of the prophet. It is said that a spiritual teacher who declares himself independent wishes to liken himself to a prophet, which will lead him to blasphemy and infidelity. When our prophet stated that his wise companions are like the prophets of the Israelites, his meaning was other than this. For the prophets who came after Moses all followed the religious principles that Moses brought. They did not bring new precepts, they followed the same laws. Like them, the wise among the people of Muhammad, whose function is to teach the select few among the pure, follow the wisdom of the prophet, yet present the ordinances, and that which is forbidden in a different and new way, open and clear, showing their students good deeds with the example of their own righteous acts, performed at a different time and in different circumstances. They encourage their followers by pointing out the joy and beauty of the principles of the religion. Their aim is to help their followers to clear their hearts, which are sites for building the monument of wisdom. In all this they follow the example of those disciples of the Prophet, who were called the people of the woolen garb, who had abandoned all worldly activity to stand at the gate of the Prophet and be close to him. Those disciples gave news as they received it, directly from the mouth of the Prophet. In their closeness to the Prophet, they reached such a level that they were able to talk about the mysteries of the ascension of the Prophet even before he revealed these secrets to his companions. These saintly teachers possess a closeness similar to that of the Prophet to his Lord. A similar trust and guardianship of divine knowledge is bestowed upon them. They are the bearers of a part of prophethood and their inner being is secure under the guardianship of the Prophet himself. Not everyone who possesses knowledge is in such a state. The ones who have reached it are closer to the Prophet than to their own sons and family, and are like his spiritual sons with an affinity closer than mere blood relationship. They are the true inheritors of the Prophet. A true son possesses his father's essence and secret, both in his exterior appearance and in his inner being. The Prophet explains this secret as were a special knowledge like a hidden treasure that only those who know the essence of Allah can find. Yet when the mystery is revealed, no one who is conscious and sincere can deny it. That knowledge was placed in our Master during the night voyage, his ascension to his Lord. That mystery was hidden in him behind thirty thousand veils. He did not reveal its secret, except to those among his disciples who were closest to him. It is by the propagation and blessing of this secret that Islam will continue to reign until the last day of the worlds. It is the inner knowledge of what is hidden that leads one to that secret. The worldly sciences, arts, and skills are as the shell of that inner knowledge Yet the ones who are skilled in these may hope one day to possess what is in that shell. Some of these men of knowledge possess only what it is obligatory for a human being to possess, and others become masters and preserve knowledge from being lost. Yet others call humanity to Allah with good advice. Some of them follow the way of Muhammad and are led to Hadrat Ali, who is the gate to knowledge through which enter those who are invited by divine invitation. 
Invite to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and good preaching, and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Surah Nal 125. What they mean in their words is the same. Its appearance of difference is only a matter of details and manner of expression. Actually, there are three meanings that appear as three different kinds of knowledge, acted upon differently, but converging into one in the tradition of our Master, the Prophet. Knowledge is divided into three, for no single person can carry that whole load of knowledge, nor is able to act upon it. The first part of the verse, Invite to the way of thy Lord with wisdom, corresponds to the divine wisdom, the essence and beginning of all and everything. Its possessor must, like the prophet, act in accordance with it. It is only given to the true and brave man, the spiritual warrior, who will defend his position and fight to preserve that knowledge. Our Master describes him thus, The zealous effort of the true man can shake the mountains, the mountain meaning the heaviness of the hearts of some. The prayers of these men are accepted. When they wish for something, it happens. When they wish something to disappear, it evaporates. He grants wisdom to whom he pleases, and he to whom wisdom is granted receives indeed a benefit overflowing. Surah Bakara 269. The second is the outer knowledge indicated in the Quranic verse as good preaching. It is the shell of inner wisdom. The ones who possess it preach the good and teach good action, and forbid man what Allah has forbidden. The Prophet praises them. The man of knowledge preaches with kindness and gentleness, while the ignorant man teaches with harshness and anger. The third knowledge is concerned with regulating worldly human affairs. It is the husk over religious knowledge, which is the shell over divine wisdom. It is the knowledge destined for those who rule men, man's justice over man, man's government of man. The last part of the Quranic verse previously mentioned describes their function and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. Such people are the manifestation of Allah's attribute of Al-Khalidr, the overpowering dominator. Their function is the maintenance of order among men in accordance with divine law, as the on-repentance and on-teaching by the word protects the shell, while the outer knowledge, which is the shell, protects the inner knowledge, which is the seed. The Prophet advises, frequent the company of wise men, obey your just rulers. Allah Most High revives dead hearts with wisdom, as He makes the dead earth come alive with vegetation by means of His reign. He also says, wisdom is the lost property of the believer. He picks it up wherever he finds it. Even the words pronounced by ordinary men have descended from the preserved tablet of Allah's decrees concerning all things happening from the beginning until the end. That tablet is kept in the high realm of causal intelligence, yet words are pronounced in accordance with one's level. The words of those who have reached the level of truth are directly from that realm, the realm of Allah's intimacy. There is no intermediary there. Know that all will return to its origin. The heart, the essence, has to be awakened, made alive, to find its way back to its divine origin. It has to hear the call. One has to find the one through whom the call will come, the true teacher, that is an obligation upon one, the Prophet says. Knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim, woman, and man. That knowledge is the final stage of all knowledge, the divine wisdom, the knowledge which will lead one to one's origin, to the truth. The rest of knowledge is necessary only to the extent that it is useful. Yet for the sake of one's ego, one is ambitious for worldly knowledge. Allah is pleased with those who leave ambition for worldly honors and fame. For these worldly benefits are what hinder one in one's voyage to him. Say, I ask of you nothing in return for this but love and attachment to those near of kin. Surah Shura 23 According to tradition, the meaning of the words, what is close to you, is to come close to truth. As we conclude our exploration of Chapter 5 in Jelani's The Secret of Secrets, we hope you found inspiration in the teachings of Sufism, repentance and the path to spiritual awakening. Thank you for joining us on this sacred path of discovery. If you've enjoyed this series, remember to like, share and subscribe so you never miss a chapter. Until next time, may your quest for divine knowledge and inner transformation be blessed with light and guidance.